Hi, my name's Mel Stewart, and you're watching the Swim Swim podcast. Joining me is Lenny Kreselberg and Coleman Hodges, Swim Swim's head of production. Lenny Kreselberg is a four-time Olympic champion and the second best-looking man in the sport of swimming. How are you doing, Lenny? I am doing very well. I'm glad to join you guys. that you pointed out who is second best looking man. So obviously the host is the best looking man in the sport of swimming. No, no. In the world. Actually, it's Reich Neithling, but if I'm number one on your list, if that's the list that you have on your bathroom mirror when you're ranking the dudes, I, I'm honored and I just want to say thank you, Lenny. <laughs> uh, here you go, you're my, you're my favorite swimmer. And I actually wrote down my list of favorite swimmers for today. My favorite swimmers are Lindy Kraserberg, Simone Manuel, Michael Phelps, John Neighbor, Pablo Morales, Rock Santos. But tomorrow, I think it's going to be Simone Manuel, Michael Phelps, John Neighbor, Lindy Kraserberg. But today, Lindy Kraserberg tops the list. Thank you, Mel. <laughs> just, hey, uh, list there. It's a great list. You got to got to make your list every day. Don't you make your list every day when you wake up? Who Who are my favorite swimmers? Don't you do that every morning? <laughs> not Not lately. <laughs> <laughs> so here, there's something that people, uh, you know, we know you as a four-time Olympic champion, an icon in the sport, a, a towering figure in backstroke in the, in the, in the lineage and in the superiority and the, the dominance of USA Swimming, Team USA's dominance in the backstroke. But, you know, what a lot of people don't know about you is that you've really, you, you, you use that as a platform and you've built a great business in swim since you retired, uh, Lenny Kreselberg Swim Academy. And could you just tell us a little bit about that and how you've been so successful? Yeah, you know, uh, it's now we, we rebrand and it's called Swim Ride Academy Champion by Lenny Kreselberg. So got to put the champion in there. But r really, the, it's all about uh, learn to swim. Uh, obviously, you know, no, we know the statistics. We know the high rates of drowning. We know uh, the importance of teaching water safety. And we also know very well that challenging transition from being a professional athlete and having such a narrow focus and pursuing your dreams. And then whether you achieve them or not, it's still over, right? What are you going to do next? And that, that transition is a scary one. And for me, I was fortunate enough to start thinking about it while I was still competing, while I was still preparing for Athens. Um, I, I, I was lucky to also have um, a lot of friends outside of the sport that were pretty business entrepreneurial. So I could kind of tap into their knowledge, their resources, and so that I can, I guess, mold my own vision of what I wanted to do. And uh, of course, I was lucky, lucky enough to stay in the sport of swimming. Obviously, the sport has given me so much. And I understood that you can, you can do number of things you can uh, fulfill a mission you can make a living and then you can also wake up in the morning and be excited about the day what you're going to do so i don't ever look at this as my work you know this is my passion this is the love that i uh, you know i have for being part of this and building my my company Let's just get to the meat of that. I, I, I heard it all. It's heartwarming. It's wonderful. It's a fantastic wisdom from Lenny Kreselberg, but you're represented by Peter Carlisle at Octagon, which means, are you Michael Phelps' best friend? Uh, I know Michael well. Uh, obviously, through the years, uh, I've had quite a uh, quiet time with Michael experience, especially, you know, when Michael was younger. Uh, you know, there is a 10-year 10, 10, 10 age difference between me and Michael. Um, but I, I have definitely seen him from the 15-year-old in, in Sydney and ascending to and really revolutionizing our sport. So it's been a, quite a, a, an incredible journey to watch. And also, you know, what's been actually very, very impressive is to see him grow as a, as a person. And now being a family man, it's just it's an incredible transformation. And, you know, I've seen it 
up close and personal. I haven't been as close to him lately, uh, but certainly we stay in touch regularly. I'm on the uh, Michael Phelps Foundation, uh, on the board of the foundation, so I am still involved quite a bit. So we'll just say with the, the Oxygon Connection, you're a top five Michael Phelps friend, and we'll, I'll put that on my bathroom mirror because I list those out too. Who is Michael Phelps' best friends? That's, that's how we define our lives. The, the, uh, so I, I, here's the thing. You, you have one of the most interesting stories in swimming. And, uh, and I love you know, when folks come on because it's, uh, you, you dig into their past and sometimes you take for granted the small details that, that stick out for you. Um, and in, uh, you came, your, your family came here in 1989 from Odessa, Russia, which is now Odessa, Ukraine. And, it's, uh, and they, they struggled financially. And um, that really resonated with me. I grew up in a poor and, I, and our house was 1,100 square feet. My sister's bedroom was the lit, was in the living room. Uh, that we'd go six months without eating meat. But when I read your these details, I was vaguely familiar with them, but I didn't fully understand. I just knew that it you had to cross a lot of hurdles just to get to swim practice. Can you shed some light on that? Yeah, it was definitely quite an experience coming to LA in early in '89 and. Um, you know, listen, my parents uh, brought myself and my sister to this country for better opportunities. You know, we, you know, being Jewish, growing up in Soviet Union, we faced a lot of discrimination, anti-Semitism, and my, my parents wanted better for, for their children. And they sacrificed a lot uh, to come to this country. You know, they were in their late 40s, early 50s, not speaking the language. It's challenging as an immigrant. So we came into a city like LA that is a, it's a, it's a huge city and um, it was tough. It was tough. First of all, not knowing the language whatsoever. You know, my, I remember my dad went to work uh, at $2 an hour at first, you know, just, uh, just trying to do something just, and, uh, and uh, you know, for me, you know, swimming was always that outlet, you know, just kind of get away from the reality but I also realized that I couldn't depend on my parents. My, they needed to find jobs. They needed to, my mom tried to learn the language so she can, you know, find a, a, an okay job. And I remember I had to take a bus over an hour each way just to get to practice and then walk another 20 minutes to get to the pool and then come back late in the evening because that's what it was. I mean, I was still, you know, thankful for the opportunity. And I also saw how hard my parents worked and how, how much they sacrificed. And for me, it was just, there was no other option, you know, you know, and, uh, you know, fortunately enough, I also, you know, got a really solid um, foundation in terms of the hard work. Uh, when I was back in Soviet Union, because I, I was part of the Soviet sports system. So that, that was intense and very young age. And yet, and at going through that, it builds your character, it forms your character. And I understood and I realized that, you know, to achieve success, hard, there is no substitute for hard work. There's, you're gonna have challenges, but there's no substitute for that. And I really carried that with me. And I never looked for excuses. You know, this was our life. This was what my parents brought to. And you got to grind through it. There, there was no other options. And, um, you know, the first uh, number of years in L.A., that was kind of the struggle and the challenge we had to go to. But I always believed that there is, a, you know, I guess the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of, you know, we'll break through and, and something will happen. You became a naturalized citizen in 1995. But it, it's, a, it's an immigrant success story. And uh, a lot of people in the United States forget that this is a nation of immigrants it's a large part. We always have new ideas, fresh talent, people who have a lot of grit coming here for the American dream, and you are the American dream. So did you feel immigrants historically in this country have a tough time, just with their own struggles and their own, like, becoming immersed and acclimated to the culture? Did you experience that? Uh, aside from the language barrier, did you ever feel like someone made you they didn't make you feel welcome. Did you ever experience any hardships like that? Um, for me, it was more, 
Yeah, I was actually relatively fortunate about that. I mean, uh, it's interesting because I, I joined the swim team literally like two weeks into coming to the U.S., uh, Team Santa Monica in L.A. And I will tell you, the families were so welcoming. They were, you know, they understood where I came from. And my parents didn't have resources uh, to take me in, uh, during the weekends and to the swim meets, right? So because they were working, nor or would even have a car to go such a far distances. So uh, parents of the kids on the team would come pick me up from home and take me to swim meet. Sometimes the coaches would come pick me up. So it was a really... Um, it was an incredible effort to, to, to help. And so I, I, I remember that very clearly. And then, you know, and then I had an interesting balance because I also had a lot of uh, immigrants, friends that, uh, Russian speakers that also came at the same time. LA has got a pretty large Russian, Russian speaking community. So we were experiencing the same thing kind of going through it. And, but at the end of the day, it was the, the swimming part of it that really, um, you know, kind of, I was able to balance the two, that, that the, the comfort of the Russian culture and yet this unknown trying to um, integrate myself into, into an American culture. Uh, but swimming really did help me quite a bit to, to, to make that transition. Um, and, you know, honestly, never felt like I was, uh, wasn't welcome. Just out of curiosity, it's, it, you came here in 89. Was this after the wall came down? Was that, is, was that the impetus for you guys coming west? Um, no, we came in March of 89. The wall came out in October. Uh, and I also went through the immigration process where we lived in Vienna and Rome for four months. So we actually left Soviet Union in December of 88. Gotcha. Okay, very cool. Wow, interesting. But it's a... Uh, but it was... What's interesting, we, we, should, we should go ahead and say this, the, you were fleeing religious persecution. Uh, you actually went back to the homeland, uh, Israel, to the Maccabean Games. We were the flag bearer, so, and uh, you, you sat out a world championships, correct, to do that. So you, you, honored, yeah, you, honor, you, you honored your people. Yeah. You're a good man. Let's, uh, I, there's something I didn't know was that uh, you didn't go right to USC. You were at Santa Monica Community College, which is, by the way, I, if, I'm, I, if I understand this correctly, I spent some time in Los Angeles. Harvard by the Sea, is that correct? That is very true. You went to Harvard by the Sea and swam at Harvard by the Sea and were a champion at Harvard by the Sea. What was that like? Yeah, it was, it was a very interesting experience for sure because, I, again, I, I didn't have the resources for proper training that I really needed it. Um, certainly not to, to get to a point where any college would look at me and potential offer scholarship. I certainly, you know, financially, we didn't have the means to, to pay um, for, for a university. So I ended up uh, going to Santa Monica College. Uh, I didn't swim high school because my high school didn't have a swim team. I, I swam at a Jewish community center, sm small um, swim team, basically throughout my high school years. And uh, Went to some Santa Monica College, just basically a walk on. It's a community college. Anyone can join if you can, you know, hang there for two hours of swim practices. But they had uh, they had a lot of uh, you know former swimmers, former college swimmers that were just coming in to train. They weren't part of the community college team, but the coach Stu Blumkin was very welcoming and kind of a stable in in the community. So. I swam there for, for a year, did pretty well. Um, I actually broke the junior, uh, junior college national record in 200 backstroke, so I had a pretty quick drop. And then, I don't know if you know that story, but uh, um, Stu, my community college coach, called Schubert uh, at USC and said, I got this kid, he's pretty talented, but raw. And uh, can, can he come and train with you guys in the summertime? And Mark, from what I understand, Mark said, sure, where he, you know, if he can hang with us, we're here for the community, you know, if he can try, we can do it. And, you know, listen, at that time, you know, there was Bridgewater was training there, Greg Burgess was there, uh, John Still, um, uh, Jim Wells, I mean, you're talking about Janet was already there. So, I mean, you got superstars of the sport, and I'm walking in there. I remember the first day on deck, I was so intimidated. Uh, whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. You were intimidated. 
were you the buff, the super buff bodybuilder, Lenny Kreselberg, seven on deck, or were you like- Not, not in 1994, Mel, not at all. I was not, I was uh, skinny, I was, I was intimidated. I wasn't comfortable, honestly, yet speaking the English. Um, and it was very, it was very interesting. I was so excited about the opportunity uh, to, to train in that setting. And you know how, you know, we have a, a, an unspoken unspo etiquette in the sport. You don't go fast during warmups. You just, everyone kind of takes their time, right? It, it takes time. You know, you kind of get yourself into it. I was holding right from the start. And I know I robbed a lot of guys <laughs> the wrong way. It's like looking at me like, who is this? What, what's he doing? So you, 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 you can share that with us. How, how, how soon before you were kicking everybody's butt? Um, <laughs> no, it, it did take a while. But I will tell you, though, um, two months into it, um, and I could only train singles because I was at that also at that time working 40 hours a week, uh, just uh, helping my, my, my parents, just trying to financially, you know, offset some of the expenses. So... I could only do morning workouts, but two months, like at the end of the summer, um, and Don, Don Wagner was the assistant uh, to Schubert at that time, and, and Don throughout the summer really took liking to me and kept saying, Lenny, you're really good. You can be one of the best. And by end of the summer, Schubert gets me into his office and tells me, Lenny, I want to offer you a full ride to USC. And I think you can be, and he goes, I believe you can be the best backstroker in the world. Did you cry? Uh, I was emotional. I didn't cry. Did you cry? I, didn't I think you cried. Yeah. yeah. I didn't shed a tear, Mel, but it was, um, it was certainly special. You know, obviously, um, knowing Mark's resume of what, what he's accomplished, the athletes he has coached, for him to, to be so confident to tell me that, it was very eye-opening. That, I will say that that's probably the first time in my life that I really believe that I belong in this level. And that I can achieve anything. Um, just, but, just hearing it makes me want to cry. It's a, it sounds like such a big moment. It, it, working forty hours a week, only you can only do one practice a day, and Schubert steps up, and uh, yeah, that that's a big door opening. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And uh, it was, I mean, to this day, I mean, it's a, it was a, such a life changing um, moment for me. Obviously, you know, getting a. Um, your education is such a high, you know, prestigious uh, university having a chance to, you know, swim at USC. The other part of it is that uh, because I, I still needed a year, to like I needed full credits to transfer, I couldn't train with USC for a year. So a lot of times what I would do is uh, I would, uh, you know, USC has a diving well. So the team would train in, in a big pool. And I would be by myself in the small pool and Mark would just give me workouts and I would do them myself. You just put a 50 pound plate on your back and that's how you got so buff. That, that's, that's the real story. Exactly. So, hey, Ed, we, let's, this, this is important to say, you know, uh, Schubert is a towering figure in our, in our sport. And uh, I think he won, he won over 30 U.S. national championships when he was down to Mission Viejo went you know he coached to college then he was the national team director for a while for usc swimming now he's back at mission viejo Every, anybody who's an elite athlete that comes in contact with schubert they have they're like they're like schubert doesn't like me or schubert no i'm cool schubert likes me schubert likes you based my opinion schubert likes you based on one thing after knowing this guy for three and a half decades he likes you if you're a workhorse and i'd like to get into your workhorse habit and how you got so buff, what did that look like? You know, did, what is your backstroke style and how did that develop and how did you become the guy that went on to win those three gold medals in 2000 at the Sydney Olympic Games? Yeah, well, listen, I mean, I was always pretty strong. I, 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 was, I was a late bloomer. That's, that's important to say. And I think for a lot of young athletes that are listening to your podcast, sophomore in high school, five, six, 105 pounds. So if you, if you got some sophomores that are listening and think they're small and short, don't give up. <laughs> uh, so, um, so I really grew into my body by age of about 19, 20. And, uh, you know, 
lifting was always. Whoa, stop, 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 stop. Did you have a girlfriend when you were five, six? No. <laughs> yeah, you didn't have a girl. Did you have to become the good looking Lenny Kreselberg who's buff? <laughs> Did you have to become the man, Lenny Kreselberg? That's a dumb question, but I had to ask you. I'm just messing with you. I interrupted you for no reason. That definitely helped. That helped. All right. Uh, I'm, just, I'm teasing you. I'm going to shut up now. You tell your that's story. That's good. I like it. I like it. I appreciate that. Uh, those type of questions. That's the reality of life. You know, you can be, you got to, you got to say it how it is. And, but listen, when I was in Soviet Union, we lifted at 10 years old. So I, you know, again, I started to look back to that experience. It's like I, I needed to be, in order for me to be better, I needed to, I needed to lift weights. I needed to lift weights seriously. And I really made that a priority once I came to, once I started to train with Mark at USC. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, those mid-90s, Swimming, and I don't know, I think it gets uh, more attention from the athletic department nowadays in terms of weight training and having dedicated uh, trainers that are attached to the, to the sport. It wasn't the case in the 90s at USC. It was like football was it. So we were pretty much creating our own weight workouts. You know, obviously Mark had some guidelines, but, you know, I, for me, I was creating my own workouts. I was trying to I was trying to think of how do I imitate the, what can I do in the weight room that uh, translates into the water in terms of, so if I'm swimming, so if I'm, my race is, uh, let's say 55 seconds for a hundred backstroke, I was trying to do as many reps as possible in 55 seconds, uh, ju you know, just to see, just to get that muscle burn. I, there was no uh, physiology behind it. It was to me. It was all common sense. It was backed by nothing at all. It was all common sense. But um, and again, I think for me, power was important. I, you know, if, if those that broken broken my stroke down, you you watch me underwater. I pulled pretty wide. So you know, you see a lot of backstrokers these days when they pull underwater, they try to keep the elbow closer to their body. So there's a lot more elbow bend. For me, it was actually opposite. You know, my, my arm was almost straight. So that takes a lot of power to be able to, to generate, uh, you know, to generate tempo when you're, you know, you're pulling that water so far out that, you know, so far out there. And uh, I think that could be one of the reasons why I had a uh, number of shoulder surgeries because I put so much uh, stress on that. And in fact, just on a side note, when I started to train with Dave Salo for 04 games, we, and I, I continued to have shoulder problems. We try to change my stroke a little bit and actually bring the elbow a little bit closer to my body. Um, but in terms of uh, training in general, and I think you, you talked about Mark uh, in terms of you know, how he appreciated the athletes that worked hard. Um, I'm a great believer that um, in order to be successful, you have to have an, a great relationship with your coach and you have to respect your coach. Again, I come from a culture where you have to respect authority. So if a coach, and I've always, you know, Mark was always prepared when he came to practices. He had a plan, he was prepared. There is something to be said for someone that's wants you to succeed to be prepared and I almost felt it was an obligation for me to give it my all because that person gave themselves you know for me to be successful or for our team to be successful however you look at it I you know I was looking at it more that individual relationship so yeah, just to, to put it put it through this lens you broke the world record in the 50 100 and 200 back in 98 that's a 99. break. That's 99, excuse me, 99. Yes. Break, yeah. Breakthrough moment. What, I mean, how did you feel at that point in your career and your evolution of becoming the icon Lenny Kraselberg? Listen, I, I, I had tremendous confidence. I mean, you, 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 you followed it very closely in those years, and you, you know how, uh, you know, every time I raced, I was getting better and better and better. I had a lot of confidence. But again, you know, I was also fortunate because I had Brad Bridgewater training with me 
every single day. I, you know, my Olympic games were twice a day in the pool at USC. So there was nothing that I wasn't prepared for. So anytime I walked into the competition, I, I walked to, to, to my race, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew how it would feel. I, I knew everything. I, I visualized it because I, I lived it every single day. I, you know, I, I was incredibly fortunate to be in that position where I have an Olympic gold medalist, uh, Brad won the two back in 96, training with me every single day. I mean, how, how much better could it get? So, you know, by the time 99, I broke those world records. I was ready to break them. I knew I, I, I would, you know, I knew I was, I actually knew going into Perth, I mean, into Sydney at Panpac that I was going to break them because I just felt so good. I felt so confident, strong, and I almost broke it uh, at Nationals a couple of weeks prior to it on shave. So it was just, 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 a, it was just a matter of time. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. I've been a huge fan watching you because I was retired and I enjoyed, I was like, who is this guy? He had such an interesting story. Um, you know, we, we just talked to uh, Jenny Thompson and she said her favorite Olympics was Sydney. It has to be your favorite Olympics. Can you take us through the excitement of what that was and why Sydney the swimming, you know, in Australia, the swimming nation was such a great host nation. Well, I, you, you mentioned Australia being such a great host nation. Uh, Australia lives swimming. I mean, for those that have been fortunate enough to be in Australia and to experience it, they will attest to that. It's a swimming country. It's, they, they, they live and breathe swimming. So as an athlete, when you're in that environment, when, when, Everywhere you go, everywhere you walk, people know swimming, understand swimming, and follow swimming. It just raises your, you know, your excitement to, to the next level. Australians are huge sports fans. The country is small. I mean, relative to other countries around the world that have hosted Olympics, they're a pretty small country. So it, it was, it just feels like it was, it was that intimate setting uh, with everyone came together um, and everyone understood sports and that is so unique um, when you're when you're in the country that no matter where you turn people understand it and I think that's what made the game so special I think for us swimming that just uh, amplified it many times more because of the knowledge understanding and excitement the country the nation had has for the sport of swimming and all of those things just it, it just all these things came together that made the games so perfect and we should note that you went on swam in 2004 after you had shoulder surgery and you picked up another gold medal in 2004 on the relay uh as we're 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 about two thir two thirds of the way through and we wanted to get to something that's kind of interesting about you i have to bring you back just for a backstroke clinic and for your opinions on all the elite backstrokers of today We'd like to get into International Swimming League. You're the general manager of the LA Current. Um, and I mean, you know, most people in, in listening to this podcast, they know that. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that you were, they started talking to you early, early in the process. And uh, so you were at the table very soon. And, um, and you, you know, we can credit you with a lot of the success in that first season. What was it like when they first came to you and you were starting off like what was, you know, what, what was the, what was the, what were the Lenny Kraselberg nuggets of wisdom that you passed along? Uh, well, listen, I, first of all, I was honored and excited that they came to me. Uh, our, our sport deserves this. I mean, our, our, our athletes deserve this. I mean, that's why I jumped on board. Um, you know, I didn't have the opportunities. You didn't have the opportunities. I mean, I had better opportunities than you had, right? Because you were, you know, a few years prior to me. Uh, but just to, to have someone, uh, uh, Constantine, coming in with this vision to change the sport and to give more opportunities to our athletes, I, I just, I wanted to be part of it. Um, I think it's really important, you know, be, besides the, the opportunity to, to bring up, uh, to raise the exposure of our sport and give our athletes an opportunity to financially uh, to be, make a better living. 
knowing the dedication, the commitment that they have to our sport. What was also so important is that I think it's the education part of educating our athletes, our professional athletes today, that you control your own destiny. That now with, with social media, with ability to build your own brand, ISL can give you the platform to control your own destiny. And I think it's really important because, you know, as athletes, again, we talked early in the show that majority have this really hard transition. And we're in this bubble and nothing else matters. Just the Olympic Games and pursue of our dream of making to Olympics and winning. Yes, that's important. That's a huge part of our sport. But there is so much more to life. And, 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 and controlling your own destiny and building your own brand now, I think it's important. And, and, and I understood that the league can give our athletes that opportunity. And it was so important for me to be part of it. And... And that's why I jumped on board and, uh, you know, continue to stay with it because I do think that, the, you know, it's, it's like in any business. It takes time to build, right? It takes time to grow. Nothing happens overnight. Rome wasn't built overnight. So it'll take some, it'll take some time. But I think we're, we're definitely the leak is in the right path and the intention to bring notoriety to our athletes and the sport is there. We're down to about seven minutes, but I want to just uh... – that was successful in the first season, uh, walking on it. If, if anyone had the, the honor of being there and witnessing that, that first historic season, walking into the pool was essentially walking into a television studio. Well done. Amazing. I, I don't know if you're liberty to say, and I probably should have prepped you ahead of time, but, you know, can you talk about what's upcoming and tease anything that you know that's interesting upcoming? Well, we know that the original, the way the season was originally going to happen with multiple locations just not happening because of COVID and everything we're going to. Right now, you know, the league is discussing potentially being in one place and doing a season in one place. Uh, that's all that I can kind of share at the moment. I think what's going to be, but, but, but the idea and the vision and the support that the ISL is trying to create for the athletes. I think it's really important and unique because you do, wherever we end up going, the, to have the best athletes in the world, world in one place for a period of time, I think it's going to be incredibly unique because besides racing and com competition racing, I think learning from each other. You know, something that I mentioned when I, the experience I had training with Brad for so many years, how that enhanced my career and what I was able to accomplish, uh, you know, being part of that. I think an opportunity to be in, a play, in, in one place and to be able to train with others and see, uh, study your opponents as well as to pick up on some uh, tips of how your competitors are training. I think it's just, it's overall going to be a, an incredible experience for all the athletes. I'll, I'll tease something and then I'm going to toss it to Coleman, but I, and I don't think I'm giving anything away. It's uh, it's, it probably be, will be expected by fans that are coming. It is like, it is, it looks like it's going to be one location. It also looks like just in, in addition to the swimming content that we see the race content, ISL will be producing additional off the deck content. That's going to be very sticky, a lot of fun. A lot of swim fans will get into but uh, Coleman, do you have any ISL follow-up? Because you are a guy on the, on deck at every event. Yeah, I mean, I, Lenny, you know, you, again, you're you're the team manager. I don't think many people realize what what goes into that and and how much fun you can have. You know, you talked about training with your opponents and and uh, and kind of the, the the swim part of it. But can you give us a little bit of an idea of of what goes on? outside of the competitions at ISL because really it is, uh, you know, I was there for a week in Budapest and it, it's, it's pretty special. Yeah. You, you know, it's really, I'm in such a fortunate position. I mean, yes, there's a lot of work that happens behind the scene, obviously putting a team together, obviously being able to bring the coaching staff together and then, uh, you know, all the logistics and administrative stuff, especially, you know, first season, uh, you know, working with limited budget, all, all hands on deck. But at the end of the day, you know, when you're actually at competitions, you, you, you almost, 
you, you're there almost enjoying the fruit, fruits of your labor, right? Uh, just seeing how you were able to put this team together and try to bring people together and then really provide the support for our athletes. Um, you know, I have obviously a unique, um, unique, I'm in a unique position where I was an, a, an athlete one time. I was an athlete on the national teams. So I understood the support that our team management was providing us when we were on national team trips. And I understood how important, how used our athletes are to that. So I wanted to make sure that we create an environment where we were on these, uh, during these trips like Budapest or Vegas or, uh, you know, DC to make sure that our athletes ha had all the support they needed it to make sure that they can, you know, perform uh, at the level we expect them to perform. But I also wanted to make sure that they understood that this was different. They're professional athletes. So I don't, I, we, we didn't want to, we wanted to make sure they understood they have freedom. We trust them. And then they, they're there to do their job. And I think, a lot of our athletes, I think all the athletes in the league really appreciated this, um, that, that this level of professionalism, that I know what I need to do because I, you know, I'm at this level, uh, the team puts trust in me that um, we can separate that. And then it's, you know, and then you, you're on your own. You do what you need to do. You do what works for you. If you've got other things happening when you're not, you know, when you're not racing and you're not training, then you do that. You know, if it's phone calls with your agents or doing or some people might be taking still classes or enhancing your whatever it is career some other way then that's you do that we got one minute left who's your favorite isl star ryan murphy <laughs> okay you're a little bit biased uh yeah, ryan, ryan murphy's it ryan murphy's awesome second favorite isl star uh, actually, I, I really like, I'm, I'm going to be biased because I'm going to talk about my team, but I, I really like Shields. Shields is, is the guy, man. Shields is score. Shields, the ISL was built for Shields. Yes. But, uh, okay, as we're rolling out, we'll say this. You're the best dressed general manager on deck at ISL matches, for sure. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we appreciate it. Will you come back on the show? Of course, anytime. Love the conversation, you guys. Really do. Okay, if you have a topic or our fans out there have a topic and they want us to talk to Lenny about that, just let us know. You've been watching the Swim Swam podcast with four-time Olympic champion Lenny Kreselberg and, of course, Coleman Hodges. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcasts on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.